Let me ask you a question. How many hours do you think you have spent in a waiting room in your life? It's a lot. Many, many hours we have spent. But have you ever actually gotten to a doctor's office or um, gotten to the dentist office or you've been at Jiffy Lube and you're expecting to wait and suddenly they just usher you in to the office? I don't know about you, but for me, I'm kind of like, wait, wait, wait. I need just a few moments to center myself, to prepare myself for what's about to happen. Could I have just a few more moments? Maybe that's you, maybe not, but I think waiting is an important thing. As I mentioned this past week, waiting is woven into the world that God has made. And what we've been looking at this week is the patience of God, that God gives to us the fruit of his patience in our lives, and we become people who learn how to wait well. Waiting is the hard act of faith. It is hard to wait, but I believe God is inviting us into being a people who can wait well. Because what I know and what we looked at is that what God wants to do in us during our waiting is just as important as what we're waiting for. And so how do we become people who wait well? How do we become people that anchor ourselves in the character of God, a God who is patient? And so this word patience means forbearance and long suffering, or the way one commentator puts it, it means a calm endurance that is tested through waiting. And so how do we have that calm endurance? How do we learn how to wait well? What I love about scripture, one of the many things is that it doesn't just teach us about patience and God's patience or that we're to wait on the Lord, but it actually shows us through stories and people in very vivid detail. And I wanna look at the life of Peter. What you see in Peter is a man who learned how to wait and how he, he waited on Jesus and what Jesus wanted to do in him and through him. And we see this all throughout Peter's life and the way that it impacted the church, the way it impacted the world. And I believe it's the way it even impacts us right here in 2020. And so here's what happens in Peter's life. Peter, it tells us in Luke 5, was fishing. He was fishing all night and he didn't catch a thing. And he comes across Jesus and Jesus there says, Peter, I want you to go out to the deep, put out to the deep and cast your nets. And I have to think here in this moment, Peter's thinking, really? I've been fishing a long time, but I don't know about this, but at your word, I'll go. And he goes, did you know that the, the counterfeit of patience is cynicism and indifference? It's a, a sense of, I don't care. I might as well I'll just resign myself to that. That that's the counterfeit of patience. I wonder if that's what Peter experienced there in that moment. If that's what he did of whatever, I'm going to go do this. At your word, I'll go. And then to his surprise, his nets are overflowing with perhaps one of the biggest catches he's ever had. And he comes back to the shore. And the reason I think maybe he headed out with indifference is because he falls to his knees and he says to Jesus, depart from me, I am a sinful man. And there Jesus, with great love in his eyes, says, don't be afraid. I'm gonna make you into a catcher of men and women. Follow me. And here is the beginning of Jesus or Peter's journey following Jesus. And we see what it looks like for Peter to wait on Jesus to do something significant in him and through him for the benefit of other people. And what we get in the stories of the gospel is that Peter is an impatient man, that he's also an impulsive man, but he's eager to follow Jesus. And we see this in so many different parts of the story. Peter's the first person when asked, who do you say that I am? Jesus asked the disciples and Jesus says, or Peter says, you are the Christ. And Jesus says, you are right. My father has revealed this to you. And he says, Peter, upon you, upon your confession, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail. And Peter is waiting on Jesus to do something significant in his life and through his life. And we see this in, unfold in some of the other stories because right after that confession, Jesus says, I need to suffer. I'm gonna need to die. And Peter says, no, no. No, you're not. That's not the way this is going to go down. That's not the way this is going to get done. But Jesus, it says, rebukes him and says, get behind me, Satan. It's in Peter's impatience, in his impulsiveness, in his uh, idea of the way this should go. Jesus calls that evil, demonic, says, that's not right. Get behind me, Satan. And Peter is rebuked and he's put into his place and he's taught what it means to wait on Jesus, to wait on the Lord. And then the next story is 
Peter, James, and John are brought up on a mountain with Jesus, and they get a glimpse of who Jesus is in his full glory. And Elijah and Moses appear. It's this incredible and extraordinary story. And Peter, again, being impatient and impulsive, says, let me, let me put up some tents. Let us stay here for a while. And there, the father says, this is my son. Listen to him. Listen to his words. I am pleased with him. And Peter, again, gets a, a lesson of what it means to wait. That we need to listen. Listen to the words of Jesus to wait. And the story continues, and it's in Luke 22 that the story unfolds. And this is what Jesus says to Peter, to Simon Peter. He says, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you, that he might sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. As he's waiting, his faith shouldn't fail. And when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers, Peter. But Peter said to him, Lord, I am ready to go with you, both to prison and to death. He's impatient, impulsive. Jesus said, I tell you, Peter, the rooster will not crow this day until you deny three times that you know me. And Peter, as we know, denies Jesus. This isn't what he wants to do, but in his patience, he grows weary. He grows impatient. In his waiting, he grows impatient and impulsive. And he denies Jesus. In fact, as Jesus is arrested again, you see this bubble up over in Peter where he takes up a sword and he tries to cut an ear off or he does cut an ear off of one of the soldiers. And Jesus again shows him the way of how to wait. And then we get to the end of the story where Jesus does suffer. He does die. He's crucified. He is buried, but he rises again. And it's at the end of the story, the end of the Gospel of John, where Jesus comes to Peter and three times says, Peter, do you love me? Feed my sheep. He reinstates Peter. And Peter continues to wait for what God wants to do in him and through him. And it's in that moment that Peter is anchored in the identity of Jesus. He knows who he is in Jesus. He knows that he is loved. And he knows what he has to do. And then in Acts, in the first chapter of Acts, right before Jesus ascends to heaven, he tells the disciples and Peter to wait. Again, they've got to wait. Peter has to wait. And he says, wait in Jerusalem until you receive the power of the Holy Spirit. And so they're waiting some more. And then it's on the day of Pentecost where something, again, extraordinary happens. And the Holy Spirit falls on them and it falls on Peter and he's filled with the Spirit. And the way Luke, who wrote the book of Acts, tells us this unfolds is that Peter, he exits the room and he preaches the most bold sermon he's ever preached in his life. Perhaps one of the boldest sermons in all of history. And he preaches this bold proclamation of who Jesus is and what Jesus has done. And it tells us in the book of Acts that 3,000 were added to them that day. That God... In all of the waiting that Peter was doing, God was preparing him for that moment. That's what God does. In our waiting, God is preparing for us something he wants to do in us so that we might be used by him in a significant way to love the people around us. So in our waiting, we can hold on to the words of Jesus. At your word, I'll go. That needs to be what we say, what I say. And let us watch what God does in us and through us when we do that, in our waiting, let's hold to his promises. Peter, as he's an older man and a wiser man, in the letter that he writes to the church, that he writes to you and to me, in 1 Peter 5, says this, and I find these words so fitting for where we're at. It's verse 6 that he says, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you, Casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. In the waiting, we're to bring all of our cares and anxieties to God. And then it's in verse 10. This is 1 Peter 5, verses 10 and 11. After you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, listen to this, will restore you, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. And so what this shows us is that in our waiting, we don't need to just pass the time, numb out to the things around us. 
No, in our waiting, we don't need to pass the time. In our waiting, we need to hold on to the promises of God, that he's a God who will restore us, confirm and strengthen and establish us in who he is and what he has done. And so friends, let us hold on to his promises in the waiting and let us watch with great expectancy of what God wants to do in us and through us. And so may God bless you today. May he keep you and make his face shine upon you and give you his perfect peace as we wait on him. Amen.